morning, everybody. We're here today in this historic setting overlooking this tremendous view of Sycamore Canyon and the Verde River with our friend and Clarkdale native Vincent Randall and his wife Erie. To honor, the first, to honor him as the first recipient of the Clarkdale Historical Society and Museum's uh, Legacy Award. I would like to thank those in attendance, including representatives from the town of Clarkdale, Mauer, Robin uh, Prudhomme Bauer, town manager, manager Tracy Helvanka, uh, and uh, CHSM board members. Um, also, uh, Mr. Randall's brother um, is also in attendance today. Welcome. Vernon, Vernon Randall. On behalf of the Clarkdale Historical Society and Museum, Board of Directors, I present you with this award. The tree represents life and family roots, and the copper signifies richness of history. Before we hear a few words from Mr. Randall, I would like to offer a few words that describe his background and achievements. First is Clarkdale native. Vincent Randall and his parents before him have lived on Randall Road west of Tuzigoot since 1911. In 1913, his mother, Lula, as a teen, witnessed the transformation of native lands near the river to the north as the 400-foot steel stack and massive smelter buildings grew from the ground and hundreds of people settled into the new town. Scholar and citizen, Vincent attended Clarkville schools where he excelled as a student athlete and citizen holding several positions in student government. In 1958, he is a 1958 graduate of Angus High School, which was located in Clarkdale at the time, and a 1963 graduate of Arizona State Teachers College, which is now NAU. Educator, Mr. Randall taught science, math, and band at Verde School District Number 3's Mingus Junior High School for 28 years. Coach, as a coach of basketball and cross country, his teams, known as Randall's Rams, won five state basketball championships <laughs> and were recognized for their sportsmanship. He also coached girls basketball at Mingus Union High School when his daughter attended there. Leader, Mr. Randall was past chairman, vice chairman, and council member of the Yavapai Apache Nation and was a board member of the Association of American Indian Affairs from 1969 to 1989. Yavapai Apache historian, Mr. Randall has served as director of Apache culture at the Yavapai Apache Cultural Resources Center since 2006. He is a recipient of awards including uh, Arizona Indian Living Treasures Award for his role as cult cultural preservationist and Verde Pride Lifetime Achiever. And finally, authentic storyteller. Mr. Randall has made countless presentations centered around clans and how the clan names are associated with geographical locations of where the families live. We have so much to learn from Mr. Randall and welcome his assistance in identifying people, sites, and families that inhabited these lands before Clarkville became a company town. We have here today Two early photographs of Clarkdale showing native dwellings near the present-day Western Drive and Tuzigut Road areas, and hope to learn about them and much more from Mr. Randall. Thank you. Almighty God for giving me a good life and bringing people into my life that shared their stories with me. I've always been interested in history ever since I was a little boy. In our way of life, uh, the winter time is when we are told stories. And I had a great aunt that, uh, that used to tell us all kinds of stories my mother, my grandmother, and all the other people. Uh, I had a great uncle that lived to be over a hundred years old, and my grandmother who was born when they, we got exiled to the San Carlos in, in 1875, 
and she was born in 1876. And so, and I think the Almighty God for giving me a good memory to remember these things today. And uh, thankful for the town of Pluckdown and growing up in this town. You know, the, your, the creation of your environment. And um, I give credit to a lot of people in this town that uh, during my lifetime that uh, nurtured me, guided me, and helped me and, uh, to live a life that has been a good life for me. And I'm ever grateful to this person sitting right next to me here that keeps me on my toes and encourages me and guides me and helps me. I'm truly grateful for my wife, Yuri, and of course my family, like my brother back there and all my other... I have other brothers and sisters. They're not here. They don't live here. They live other places. But it's, it's been a... It's been a neat thing to, to grow up in this town and to see it grow. And uh, I helped write a book for our own children in our local tribe. You know, there's two tribes here, the Yamapais and the Apaches. Two totally, two totally different tribes. We speak our own language. We don't speak the same language. We have different cultural traits and beliefs, but uh, we do live together and get along together. So the archaeologist that I work with, Mr. Chris Coder, and I wrote a small book for, for our children to understand where they came, where they came from, to give them an inkling so that they can understand and as people that teach history tell us that we need to understand where we came from to know where we're going. So we wrote this little book that uh, in the prefaces I there's a quote for me that says that that we need to share these stories. We need to know where we came from. We need to to rely on reliable information and a lot of the work I do People are always saying, we need documentation, documentation. So, in the prefaces, I said that we need to share these stories and understand and get the real truth out of it. We don't want to get to sit by and, and not record these things. And then later, somebody will come and write it for us and it won't be the truth. It will not be what it, it really was. Because they, they, they didn't live it. They didn't, they weren't here. They just showed up and through newspapers, and different documentation, they create a story which sometimes is only half of the real story. So, I'm ever grateful for the Clarkdale Historical Society for the work that they're doing, the work that uh, to help people and to help those of us that have been around for a while here to relive these stories and remember how things were and to help the people that have moved here that are now citizens of this town truly understand how, this, how we as a town grew and how we as a people came together and be what we are today. So I'm very grateful. Uh, the president here of the Historical Society was a student of mine. And uh, his father, his family, the Linders, I remember back in the days when I used to cut their lawns and so forth, working for them. And how his grandfather helped our people by 
setting up so that the Park Delta Reservation came into existence under the Camp Verde Reservation system back in 1961. And his mother, I was with her, and was Arizona State College, and uh, known his family, Uncle Matt, a good friend of my brother back there, and he's also my friend who's passed on. And all of these, and I shared the story with him this morning. I do a lot of consultations. I went to Miami for a consultation concerning a mining dump, and I went to their museum, and I looked on all these different pictures. I was telling him that all these names ended in ICH. <laughs> and I remember the days. Like his family is the Pekrich, the Medikovich, the Ladich, Kersnovich, Krumpetich. All of these families brought memories back to me about all these people that came to this place. So thank you for the honor you have bestowed on me and Thank you. Continue to help share stories that I still remember and understand and make a contribution to a town that raised me up. Thank you. Thank you. pictures from the old, the old days. First of all, just a real quick, uh, we basically fought a, what we call the Indian Wars from about 1860 to 1871. In 1871, under Ulysses S. Grant, he sent out what we call peace commissioners. And there was a man by the name of Vincent Coiler out came out, which I, my name doesn't have any connections to Vincent, but, not, but he set up a reserve, which is what we call reservations today. And basically the reservation that he set up after a military campaign to bring us in out of conflicts, he set up a reservation that basically started from where I-17 crosses the Verde River and he sent lands 10 miles on each side of the river, all the way up, 45 miles up the river to what is now Chino Valley, 900 square miles. And uh, after the military campaigns, in, we came in. And in 1873, the Yavapais were brought over from their Camp Date reservation that was set up north of Wickenburg, and they were brought over and brought on the reserve in 1873. And uh, it's what we call an executive order reservation. There's three types of reservation. There's a treaty reservation like you do with any country, where it goes through Congress and the president signs it. Then there's a, uh, then there's the, uh, the, uh, Executive Order Reservation, which is what Ulysses S. Grant set up, which is kind of a useless reservation because you can do away with it tomorrow. It's, uh, it's just a piece of paper. So in 1875, they reneged on the reservation, tore up the, the treaty, and we were marched out of here. So eventually, we're like the Jewish people. In 1948, when the Jew country of Israel was reestablished, all the Jewish people went home, or well, they're going home still. And it's because of what God gave them that land, the land of Canaan. And we believe the same thing in our way of life. But God gave us where we came from. Basically, I came from that country up there in the timber country. That's where my clan comes from. And uh, so after being in San Carlos and the 
in a concentration camp. We finally drifted home starting in 1889. And as we went home, we found out that it, our land was taken over by the ranchers and so forth. So they chased us off our land. The Forest Service grabbed public land in 1905 and told us that we couldn't live there. So we drifted and basically we drifted where the jobs were to survive because that's one of the things we learned by working with the eat. So that's how we drifted back into this country. And then we first came back into this country for the jobs and, and ranches and the mines and the smelter. Uh, they first set up a camp right over here where the smelter used to be. With the Abbeys and the Apaches came back to this country. Like I said, we came from the north of the timber country, but because of the jobs there, we moved here. And after living there, when Clark decided to build a smelter, we got moved up and told to leave again. And the Abbeys went over here to where the reservation is today. And the Apaches went south over there in that direction. And so that's what these camps are, starting somewhere around 1910 through 1915. And these are wikiups that we lived in. And this is my grandma and grandpa and them. And this is their wikiups. Another interesting story my mom told me was, this wake me up right here, I always call it the first casino, because there was a woman that ran card games in here. <laughs> and they played cards like you play gin and rummy. Uh, and uh, they gambled in here. Back in here was the ceremonial ground. This is where they did their ceremonies. And most of the, these were all Apaches on this side. Do the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and this is around 1915. Already, you know, we're still living here. Here's the ceremonial grounds. My family moved over in this area, and this is their wiki ups. And, you know, we lived as, in clusters with family or close relation or immediate family shall we say and so this is my family and their immediate and from the old road used to come around here and swing here and then they went on up this way and this is the old schoolhouse that they built for the, the children here that were here and some of the Abbeys that come and this is the schoolhouse that eventually burnt down and um, and you can see all these different woodcups. Now, because we were always chased off our land and everything, a lot of our relatives and people moved back to San Carlos, back to the reservation where they were marched off to because they said, at least we can live in peace down there and we got a piece of land to live on. So there were some, just recently, just this week, I met a descendant of one of my grandma's uh, first cousin that lived with us, a descendant of a first cousin of my grandma that used to live here. We eventually moved from this spot up to where I live today in, in 1911. But basically we came back in here about 1903, 1904, somewhere in there. And uh, just for another piece of history, right on this ridge right here was a big murder situation at one time. Our own person uh, murdered uh, five, I believe it was five members of his family. And they're buried. I live right about here, but up on top of the hill where I live, there's a graveyard up there, and that's where those people are buried that got murdered. And uh, they eventually caught him. His name was Justin Head. The reason why is name was Justin Hare was an educated. A lot of our people back in San Carlos and so forth, our children were rounded off and they were sent off to school. And Justin Head was one of them that was sent back to Pennsylvania where Jim Thorpe went to school, Carl Law Inland School. And Justin Head came back and, and a lot of our travel members 
But Justin Head came back and worked in, at the Wingfield store, and there was a guy by the name of Boss Head that owned it before the Wingfields. So he took the name of Head, Justin Head. So anyway, there's a quite a long story about that, but I don't, I can save that for another time. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, there's a lot of history in this, just around this place. And, uh, but anyway, those are just a few things. Okay? And uh, I always wonder, I don't know if this is a school or not, but Jerry, Jerry Wombacker always tells me about how during the war, but before that, that this building could have been the hotel to where they it brought was. in the workers. The Birdie Hotel. Right. Yeah. The interesting thing about it, like I always say real quick, is, you know, we grew up in this town, and this town was divided, you know. I mean, there was some racial prejudice, but to me, it, it was more of an economical separation because down in Patio Town, where all the Mexicans and uh, low-end laborers were provided housing, and then over in Centerville. And then this part of the area, the, what we call Lower Town, those were the, the uh, those were the, uh, the uh, managers, uh, the uh, foremans and so forth were provided. And then Upper Town, this here, was where the elite, the people that were doctors, store owners, and the people, the high executives in the mining industry. And so uh, our, our town was divided, but I don't, nothing, there was some racial prejudice. I, you know, I always told people that, you know, up until I was about 10 or 11, I had to swim down there in patio town where there's the Mexicans and the Indians, anybody with brown after. I was telling Mike, right down in here, there's a, the, you know, the cottonwood ditch was, the dam is here because of the cottonwood. This is one of the earliest uh, irrigation system in the Verde Valley. And it kind of follows it. But over that, over that uh, where the flood is, there used to be a, a uh, cement bridge. And uh, I always wondered why, why it was there. But, What's the cement bridge right here? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a commemorative uh, program for you to take before you leave, so please come by and get one. Well, we can do that. <laughs> it would have been, except they would have been halfway down gone. <laughs> Here, I'll do it.